Charlotte Uhlenbrook is studying pant hoots, the long-range calls of chimps. She follows one male all day, recording the precise time and circumstances of any pant hoot he makes. Her Tanzanian associate, Issa Salala, follows another male and does the same. At the end of the day, they will compare their notes to see whether they've witnessed two sides of a conversation and to try and decipher its meaning. The pantoots are certainly conveying some meaning. Um, what, what I'm trying to find out is exactly how specific are the meanings of these different calls. I mean, um, does a particular pantoot convey something about a food source? Does it say, come here, boys? Does it say, I'll meet you up in the next valley? Or are they directed at family members, at allies, at friends? Or are they just generally anyone that can hear me? This is my message. We haven't got our ears tuned in. I mean, it's like different cultures very often. It's difficult to hear a slightly different uh, pronunciation. So certainly we're not hearing all the different subtleties. Sometimes there's still just a cacophony of screams out there. <laughs> Very hard push to pull them apart, but I'm sure the chimps can. I'm sure they, they know exactly what's going on. Sometimes words won't suffice. Males perform displays, dramatic performances designed to establish their dominance and intimidate rivals. Fearless, Frodo sometimes uses the human researchers to enhance his displays. Even Charlotte has fallen prey. He'll give me a whack. He'll just, just kind of add a little flourish by incorporating me. But it's not directed at me. If he wanted to hurt somebody, he could have done it. Females and their young are dominated by this threat of force. But when the fruit crop is ample, everyone feasts. A mother's care is the primary influence on a young chimp's life. Orphans find life hard. Mel was orphaned at the tender age of three. Only the generosity of others has allowed him to survive for six more years. Still, he seems to miss the affection he would have known within his mother's arms. Something this little baby seems to understand. temporary respite from a life of loneliness. Beyond the bond between mother and child, political relationships are the life's blood of chimp society. Even while relaxing, chimps are jockeying for status. Grooming is quite literally currying favor. Alliances become apparent by observing who grooms whom. Dominant animals and their allies get the best pickings. Food is a precious commodity. They often compress fruit into a pulpy wadge, something like a tobacco chore, to extract every last drop of juice. But the calls of colobus monkeys whet another appetite, 
not so easily satisfied. When a monkey troop is spotted nearby, the most avid hunter recruits other males to join forces in a hunting party. Red colobus monkeys nervously watch the gathering of bodies below. Craig Stanford studies the relationship between colobus and chimps. He hopes to shed light on the origins of human hunting. We know that at some point early in human evolution, meat became an important part of the diet. We don't understand exactly how that happened. Was it scavenging meat or hunting meat? Well, we know that the earliest stage of human evolution happened in a habitat just like this. East African woodland that's got open areas onto which our ancestors eventually moved and adapted to. So to be able to study hunting here is the best way to give us some kind of window onto the earliest origins of meat eating and our own ancestors four or more million years ago. Frodo is the best of the Gombe hunters. He's 17 years old, and yet he's killed 10% of the colobus population the last three years. It's really quite an incredible animal and a great hunter. That was Frodo. All the hunters, including Frodo, will try to catch a monkey for himself. By joining forces, the chimps hope to strand some monkeys in an isolated treetop with no route of escape except into the clutches of a chimp. Although we see elements of cooperation at Gombe, what we think we're seeing mainly is individual selfish behavior by male hunters done within a communal setting. It's a little bit like a baseball game in that baseball is a communal game in which individual players are doing their piece. And in the end, the end result is going to be success or failure. The more hunters there are, the greater the odds of success. And yet, each individual hunter is performing selfishly. As the chimps climb up, the colobus retreat to the highest branches, too slender to bear a chimp's weight. The male colobus stand their ground against chimps up to four times their size. They will even take the offensive, momentarily driving the chimps back. Holding his tail out of the chimps' reach, this male buys precious time for the escape of the females and young. Excited by the cries of hunter and prey, females appear below. 80 feet above the ground, Frodo displays his daring technique. But this time, he misses. With chimps climbing everywhere, one monkey leaps into the arms of death. Even a rear attack by the defending colobus cannot save him. The young hunter displays with his kill, but his triumph is short-lived. Freud simply confiscates the carcass. Freud settles down to share with his allies. Meat is a valuable currency, a payment for favors. Females come begging for a taste. The orphan Mel searches for scraps, but he's soon sent packing. Frodo, frustrated and hungry, tries to muscle his way to a place at the table. But Freud will have none of it leaving Frodo to rage.
his friends rush in to placate him to little effect. With up to 11 males hunting together, multiple kills are common at Gombe. As many as seven monkeys have been taken on a single hunt. Chimps like a little salad with their entree. They often eat leaves when they eat meat, sometimes eating kinds they never touch otherwise. On average, the Gombe chimps consume 20% of the colobus monkeys in their range each year. A taste for meat begins early. <laughs> 